Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this session. This session deals with automation and human performance. Just to recapitulate what we have already done, in the previous session we talked about cognitive resource demand which adversely affects performance. And then mental workload assessment techniques include several techniques, uh, concurrent task performance in which simultaneously two tasks are carried out. and the effect on both the tasks or one of the tasks may be negative uh, because of the simultaneity. Then we talked about behavioral measures and subjective measures and neuroergonomic measures. Then how to select an appropriate technique, uh, we talked about a decision making process and finally uh, it is important to remember that a combination of workload assessment techniques provides a more comprehensive measurement because a single technique will provide some aspects of the workload and then a converging measurement can be obtained if several measurement techniques or approaches are applied. Now uh, what are the consequences of workload? There are several consequences and to understand these consequences is important because it will be related to automation. First thing is that there is a task performance degradation. Either one of the tasks is degraded or both the tasks are degraded. Primarily it is important to remember that one of the tasks which is the priority task should not be affected, the primary task. Then more efficient task performance with fewer resources is possible. For example, using heuristic decisions such as satisficing. In satisficing the complete information about the situation is not used and the nearest or best solution that is possible okay, is applied. So that can lead to certain errors in decision and therefore it is again to be decided whether that should be allowed or not allowed. Then task shedding, quitting, just leave the task, shed task in a non-optimal fashion. So shared some tasks and that may not be optimal, some parts of the task may be shared, some tasks may be shared and this is how it is possible to handle some of these consequences. Uh, generally as we have talked about the consequences, these are negative consequences. Workload is related to stress, physiological arousal and performance. So let us see what is stress and how it affects performance. There are uh, several effects of stress and there are ways, different ways to understand what will be the effect. One approach is the engineering psychology approach uh, where the stress strain model is considered as the basis to understand. As we know that whenever an external force is applied on a physical body, it introduces certain strain, strain, a change in the body shape or length of the wire for example. Then to compensate for that, some internal force is set up to balance it and that is stress. So stress and strain go together and uh, one is the consequence of the other basically because of the external forces. Then uh, there is physiological arousal. There can be physiological arousal in the human body and that again is related to performance and that is also related to stress. Then there is a performance change. So let us look at the, how the stressors affect and where do the stressors come from. Stressors generally come from the environment. For example, there are direct stressors in the form of ambient conditions, say light, noise and they are there in the environment and they come as an input 
to the performance situation. And so the stressor influence there and uh, they then they influence information processing. And then there are direct stressors again in the form of vibration which affect the output side, the performance side directly. And stressors can directly influence the information processing. There are some indirect influences in the form of physiological arousal for example. And there are different indicators of physiological arousal. For example, heart rate goes up in physiological arousal, pupil diameter changes, there is an increase, there is a dilation of the pupil size, body temperature goes up and EEG and fMRI can also indicate as to the level of physiological arousal that is taking place. So this is how the stressor influences performance in various ways. Then there is some phen phenomenological experience. The experience of the individual because of the situation in which the phenomena are taking place. That also is an outcome of the consequences. So almost everything influences performance. That is because of the stressors. To understand arousal, there is a law which is called yerkes dawson law. And this law provides a relationship between performance and arousal. The relationship is an inverted U kind of relationship and an optimal level of arousal can be found out where the performance will be maximum. So when the level of arousal is low, for example, when we get up, then our arousal level is low and therefore our sensory system does not operate at the best level. At that level, the performance is weak. And there are various explanations in terms of the poor attention or the, it is not possible to be aware of the situation immediately after we get up. But as the day passes and very quickly the arousal increases and then we reach a certain level where our arousal becomes maximum. There we can give the best performance. But if the arousal goes beyond the optimal level, then there is a decline in performance. So there is a level at which the performance will be strongest, highest, that is the optimal level of arousal. And beyond that, there will be a decline in performance, which is impaired performance because of strong anxiety. So generally, uh, the level of arousal will lead to anxiety. And if the anxiety becomes too strong, performance will become low. And at very high level, it will become very, very low. The, uh, so one need to have an optimal level of arousal for best performance. And this optimal level of arousal will depend upon the different tasks. If the task becomes more complex, then the uh, arousal will reach very soon and performance uh, may be uh, declining after that. For simple tasks, the most often the task which is simple will be performed almost at a high level irrespective of what is the arousal level. For example, the simple task is responding to uh, the individual name. So if somebody calls me, for example, by my name, I'll respond to the individual at almost all levels of arousal. So uh, simple task, for simple task, we may find a function like that. But if it is a complex task, a higher energy expenditure task, for example, for weightlifters, they should have a very high level of arousal to give the best performance. And for them, the function may look like that. So depending upon the task, similarly for the cognitive task, if the cognitive task is more demanding of the resources, then there will be a high level of arousal, but not very high level of arousal because then the errors will start coming in. So there are some physiological and psychological factors that deteriorate at the deterioration stage. So what gets deteriorated because of which the performance goes down? There are uh, three important things that happen. One is fatigue. So 
when the arousal level is slightly above the optimal level, then fatigue sets in. Phys fatigue is a physiological process. So, physiologically the individual gets fatigued and because of which the responding will decline and action selection, action implementation, execution, all that will be affected. Then as the arousal goes further, it is a stage of burnt out. So, no more energy is left completely finished. And then panic, if it becomes very high, there is panic. So, when the level of arousal is high, there is panic. So, this arousal can be considered as a level of stress. More the arousal, more is the stress. And this level can be measured again in terms of the physiological consequences, for example, body temperature. So, generally it is found that those individuals who have a high body temperature during the middle of the day, they will perform at their best level during the middle of the day. But there will be some individuals for which the body temperature will be high early in the morning or some late in the evening and accordingly that will be the period in the day when they will have the optimal level of arousal and stress and therefore performance will be best at that time. And this has been demonstrated with physical tasks, cognitive tasks, etc. So, uh, what is the effect of stress on information processing components? Uh, we talked about the information processing model and there, uh, there are various components that we talked about from sensory reception of information, perception, attention, memory processes and action selection and action execution. So, at the selective attention level, generally because of the stress, there will be narrowing of selective attention. Narrowing of selective attention uh, does not only mean that the scope of coverage of information from the field reduces, but what becomes important is that only a part of the information is given greater focused and uh, you know that happens. Uh, so, this is called also called the tunneling effect. So, narrowing or tunneling effect is one kind of effect that happens because of the increased stress. Then there is distraction. So, di distraction of attention means that irrelevant information or irrelevant stimuli in the environment attract our attention and therefore, our selective attention that we should focus on the relevant part of the task or the relevant task that will be distracted, there will be distraction in that sense. Then working memory loss. So, working memory loss means when for example, some computation is being carried out because working memory has a limitation 7 plus minus 2 is the limit of the working memory. So, working memory limitation may be in terms of the processes, in terms of the transfer of information to the long term memory or in terms of acquisition the relevant information and handling it properly. Then perseveration. So, normally in the high stress level or high arousal level, the operator or the individual persists with a wrong method. So, even if earlier there has been an experience that the method did not work for example, then under high stress because of uh, the panic, the individual or the operator continues to apply that method although it is not the correct method, it has been experienced it is not the correct method. So, you know that happens and so, uh, you know perseveration is one consequence. Then strategic control uh, is possible uh, if uh, these effects are there. One is recruitment of more resources. So, bring in more resources. So, if there is a secondary task going on, then take away resources from that and use those resources, allocate those resources to the primary task. Remove the stressor. So, for example, in the physical environment, there may be stressors uh, in the form of ambient conditions and in the form of mechanical vibrations, for example, they can be removed and that way the stress will be reduced. Change the goals of the task. So, set simple goals, simpler goals, sub goals, try to achieve those sub goals with lesser level of arousal and then keep on adding goals, so that the arousal will decrease. Finally, do nothing. Do nothing is not a good strategy, but under very severe conditions, 
when an individual is very highly stressed, the best strategy is to do nothing for some time and come back to the situation when the level of arousal becomes lower, it, the, that subsides. Then what are the stress remedies? One is environmental solutions, some changes in the environment in the form of ambient energy conditions, mechanical vibrations and other kinds of conditions. So if there is a very unfriendly environment in terms of thermal conditions for example or humid conditions, then control them, find environmental solutions in some way. Environmental solutions can be uh, important. Then interface design, uh, visual displays and controls should be designed in such a way that information is readily available and less resources are required to process that information. So information presented in a either a pre-processed form or in a simple form. Support for emergency procedures, for example, alert alarms. So if the system is likely to go in a state of risk or danger, then some alert alarm should be presented prior to the possibility of the system going into that state. Warning signals, for example. Then training. With training, uh, generally they say if an individual is flooded with particular complex situations and a training is given on that, then the individual learns how to handle stress. There may be individual strategies uh, and because of the training, uh, there will be reduced level of arousal under similar conditions. So training can help a lot because then, you know, some specific procedures get developed for those conditions. So now we move over to automation. And after this session on automation, you will be able to define automation and describe why automation is needed. List different levels of automation. So automation can happen at different levels. And all these levels uh, can be understood in terms of the information processing model. So uh, the level means at different levels of stages of information processing. Information processing model comes very handy to understand that. List, uh, relate the levels of automation to different stages of information processing. Discuss the consequences of automation and describe human-centered or adaptive automation. So if we just uh, recollect what we did in one of the earliest lectures that uh, where we talked about the development of technology in the human history in terms of degrees of freedom. And as technologies have developed, there has been a change in the degrees of freedom. And depending upon the degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom means the number of intervening tools uh, between the human and the final target or the goal that is to be achieved. So tools can be limbs, stone tools, uh, bows and arrows, the steam engine, and then finally we had the computing machines, for example. And the degrees of freedom change from zero to four. So just to re capture, recapitulate, uh, when limbs are used, there is zero degree of freedom. The human body is in direct contact with the object which is to be operated on. And contemporary examples are, for example, wrestling, jumping, etc. for zero degrees of freedom, sword, basketball, darts, one degree of freedom because there is only one tool that intervenes between the human body and the object. Uh, or the goal, then gun, hockey, cricket, etc. Two degrees of freedom, automobile, bicycle, pinion rack, three degrees of freedom, and computers, four degree of freedom. So what happens is that in computers, what is handled is information, not the objects. So what moves is information. Whereas in three degrees of freedom, a rotary motion, for example, is converted into a linear motion. So the this is how, you know, uh, transfer of energy from one tool to another, transfer of energy from one location to another, transfer of information from one location to another, and number of tools that intervene between the human body and the final goal or object to be manipulated. Uh, these define the degrees of freedom and these identify 
what is the level of development of technology. On the basis of these examples and definition of degrees of freedom, we talked about cognitive complexity. So, when we look at the zero degree of freedom situation, then this is all physical activity and level of cognitive uh, complexity will be low. It will be there because after all any individual has to uh, know uh, when to catch the uh, object and what to do with the object. So, organization of the movements, various limb movements will still be there and there there will be some mental involvement, but it is at a very low level. So, a lot of expenditure of physical energy is required at that level, but as we move from the 0 degree of freedom to the 4 degree of freedom, the cognitive processes come into play to a very great extent and or for the systems we can call cognitive processes a general term which can be applied to humans and machine for human beings these are the mental processes. So, because of this the complexity at the cognitive or the mental level goes up. So, uh, the achievement from 0 to 4 degrees of freedom as we talk about the development of technology is not for at no cost it is at some cost and we have already seen for example, the mental workload. So, mental workload is uh, one outcome or consequence of that. So, physical workload may decrease, but the mental workload goes up and that may also influence the performance. So, how do we really find a way so that this mental workload or the cognitive complexity does not affect the work performance. So, automation is one possibility. So, automation will be anything by which we divide the workload between the human and the machine and generally when we talk about automation today, we talk about the computer operated systems. So, for example, if we talk of the uh, automatic washing machine at in the ho in our houses, then there a computer handles various processes. For example, if we set it on fuzzy uh, level, then the machine will decide uh, how much water level should be there on the basis of the load, what is lo what, what load is there in the machine and therefore, how much water will be used and then it starts various operations, cycles of operations and once it is set on, then uh, the system keeps on working till the uh, final uh, drying out maybe of the clothes. So, uh, th that is what happens, this is a very simple example, but in aeroplanes for example, or there may be automatic uh, cars, uh, vehicles for example, and various other systems which use automation. So, automation is almost there in every field today and we are all uh, living in a world where a lot of automation is there. So, automation describes a wide range of technologies that reduce human intervention in processes as we took the example of the washing machine for example. So, automation is defined in these various ways, but they basically mean the same thing that what is the workload, how it is divided between human beings and the machines, is it completely allocated to the machine, then it is a full automation, but if only a part of the workload is allocated to the machine, it is a semi automated kind of situation or the entire work may be carried out by the human being manually for example. So, automation is a term for technology applications where human input is minimized. Or automation is the creation and application of technologies to produce and deliver goods and services with minimal human intervention. This is a, this is a business a definition in a business domain whereas, the earlier two definitions are more general in say cognitive terms in the context of man machine systems. So, now uh, earlier the even you know using a, 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 a machine for shifting load from one place to another place could be called automation, but today as I said most often uh, the involvement of the computer in the total activity is considered as automation. 
So what is the purpose of automation? Purpose of automation is to do tasks that are too complex or unsafe for humans to perform. For example, complex mathematical operations. And complex mathematical operations can take a whole lot of time. But once the algorithms are developed, algorithms basically follow the procedures which a human being or an operator would follow in, say, computing something. But then the process becomes very fast and therefore time can be saved and errors will be much less, et cetera, et cetera. So complex mathematical operations and we know that we use various software for doing certain analysis and uh, the software have uh, different efficiencies, their powers and so on and depending upon our need, we select a particular software in different domains. So this may be language processing software, natural language processing software for example, or it may be a computational software where some mathematical operations have to be carried out. For example, in computing a statistical distribution or statistical property of a distribution. Then presence of radioactive elements for example, it can be unsafe to, for human beings to work in that situation. And there can be other similar kinds of situations where it will be unsafe for humans to perform. So just to give human beings a respite from these possible situations and save time, etc., it is appropriate to introduce or implement automation. Then there are human performance limitations. For example, uh, diagnosis and decision making in medicine. Uh, there are again human performance limitations there and nuclear process control. So many complex activities may be required. Uh, there also automation plays a big role. Then augmenting or assisting human performance, assisting peripheral activities. For example, phone number display, this is a simple uh, device, but there can be more complex devices. So basic idea is that when human beings are performed, certain information that is needed appears somewhere on a display and that information can be used. So it, some part of the entire process may be automated at critical positions. Then economics, you know, uh, less expensive if we introduce automation, uh, performance is less exp expensive because in a short time a lot of work output will be there, uh, whereas if humans are involved, then more number of people will be involved and that will be, uh, that will come in with other costs. For example, uh, a team may have to be developed and there will be individual differences and there will be other social issues and which can again hamper work. Therefore, it is less expensive, uh, efficient and error free performance because once the automation is reduced, it will be error error free to the extent that what algorithm is developed and whether it is a heuristic approach that we use uh, or it is some other approach. For example, in quantum computing, uh, the approach is different than in parallel computing. So uh, approaches will be different. If we get converging evidence from the two approaches, now converging evidence may not necessarily be in terms of the exact numerical value as an output, but in terms of the output on the basis of which certain decisions can be taken. So based on that output, the human operator takes a decision. For example, when we do a statistical analysis, then the software will compute various statistics, inferential statistics for example, and the human, the, the individual, the researcher takes a decision on whether uh, it supports the hypothesis that has been stated or not. Then increasing productivity, controlling more unmanned aerial vehicle for example for aerial surveillance. Uh, so these are the purposes of automation. Now there are some factors that influence the pace and extent of automation. One is commercial availability. If it is commercially available, more people will uh, use it and uh, acquire it and therefore the spread will be larger. So the extent of automation will be larger, demand will be more 
and then based on that, the experiences of the people knew automation devices uh, where uh, more with greater flexibility can be developed. Cost of implementation, that also influences the pace and the extent of automation. If the cost is low, it's more likely to be uh, implemented and accepted by people. Economic benefits, cost reduction, efficiency enhancement, meeting safety requirements, uh, remaining competitive in business domain, for example. Then human mental and physical workload reduction, both can be reduced because of automation. Then labor market dynamics, how that labor market dynamics change. There may be demand uh, from the workers to provide support to their work in terms of automation. Then social, legal, and ethical acceptance is also important. It's not that any automation is introduced, but if it has ethical issues or concerns, then there's a question mark. Now, so what do the system designers do? System designers now follow human-centered automation to integrate systems with human capabilities. So if the automation is human-centered, the acceptability, user acceptability, usability, both will increase. So there is uh, some, a model called the technology acceptance model. What is the usability? Is it usable? And is it accessible? So acceptability, usability, these concerns become important where uh, it comes to introducing or implementing automation. So what is human-centered automation? And uh, how does it integrate various components in a system? The levels of automation approach, so LOA is levels of automation. This approach defines the assignment of system control between a human and computer in terms of the degree to which both are involved in system operations. So what is the level of control? Level in terms of who is allocated greater amount of work. And level can also be related to stages. So there are two different ways in which level of automation can be considered. One is in terms of the allocation of resources to the automated system, the machine, for example, the computer, and the human. And the other is in the context of human information processing. And level of automation will depend upon at what stage of information processing is automation introduced. So these are the two possible ways. Now, Ansley and Kaber, they provided levels of automation taxonomy for human computer performance in dynamic multitask scenarios. And they developed a 10 item questionnaire. It is not necessary that we should have a 10 item questionnaire. So we'll we see uh, what the questionnaire is. But right now, we are looking at how the level of, of automation is related to the roles. So for example, uh, that these are four roles, monitoring, generating, selecting and implementing. So manual control, everywhere human being is. So this is the completely uh, human controlled everything, monitoring, monitoring a system as to how the system is progressing and what is happening to various states of the system, generating information, selecting particular information, and implementing, uh, say, action selection and implementation or action execution. Then action support. Action support can be, monitoring can be both human and computer. So basically for any level of automation that we are talking about, we see who is involved where. And once we go to the full automation, then everything is done by the computer. Uh, there is no human intervention, no role of the human beings. But all other stages, they either involve uh, human beings and computer and in various combinations of monitoring, generating, selecting, and implementing. 
and it is the completely manual control that only human being is involved for all roles. So, based on uh, such a taxonomy, the questionnaire uh, has been developed which can measure or which can assess the level of automation. So, this level of levels of automation scale measures whether the level of automation is high or low. So, high or low is a dichotomy and there need not be 10 questions, there can be more, there can be less depending upon what we really want to do. So, in a given situation we can assess the level of automation by writing down suitable and appropriate items to that particular system and then we can uh, identify these levels. So, now uh, we can see here that the at the lowest level of automation the computer offers no assistance, human must take all decisions. So, that belongs to the manual control for example. So, everything is done by the human being. So, one can see that there is a relationship between that taxonomy and these levels as identified in the levels of automation scale. And then as we go up there are uh, different items which measure different levels of automation and finally, at a high level of automation the computer decides everything x autonomously. So, once the system is set going when everything is taken control of by the system ignoring the human. So, even the decision making will be taken final action will be taken and everything will be completed. So, this scale is quite handy and uh, one can find out for different tasks as to what is the different difference in the levels of automation. Now, to understand the alternative approach to levels of automation let us uh, recall or revisit the information processing model that we talked earlier. Quickly uh, you know the for example, we had the sensory input which may be hazy uncertain uh, cues may be present there, then we have perception, then we have uh, working memory, internal mental states and working memory and uh, contribution of long term memory and decision making processes go on and they lead to response selection and uh, response execution through the motor uh, systems that say we use hands, we use verbal responses. So, various kinds of actions can be executed or implemented and that influences the environment and again uh, that serves as a feedback and a corrective step for example, can be taken. What we have to infer from this information processing model is that automation can be implemented at or removed from any stage of information processing. So, what is the experience? How is the system doing once automation has been introduced? Should it continue? Should we remove automation from certain stages or should we introduce more automation or higher level of automation at a particular stage or in different stages? Those decisions can be taken. So, Parasuraman et al. gave a, a stage of automation model. So, there are different stages of automation which are related to the information processing stages that we have looked at just now. So, these stages are information acquisition, information analysis, decision selection and action implementation. So, information ac acquisition basically involves the sensory and perceptual processes organizing information for example, will be uh, done at the perceptual level and that that information goes to the memory process central processes where information is analyzed in various ways. So, computations may be carried out, language may be processed to understand the meaning of the communication and so on on the basis of which a decision is selected and then action implementation is taken. So, at each level there can be a low level of automation or a high level of automation and it is possible that there may be different combinations. Uh, 
for reliable automation for example, there will be some level of automation. This particular model is given for air traffic control systems and for the air traffic control system what this model suggests is that we should be pretty close to a high level of automation for information acquisition. And again, so for reliable uh, automation, uh, there is a close to high for information acquisition and information analysis. Then for decision making, there are two levels. If it is a low risk functions, then let uh, there be automation level be close to high or medium. And then the, but if it is a high risk functions, then the decision selection should be done by the human being. Then it should not be left to the machine. And again, uh, for action implementation, again for high level decision, the automation in high risk functions, uh, you have moderate level of automation. And similarly, we can consider other tasks. If, uh, you know, for example, for a missile. Now, missile uh, will also come under the several controls where action implementation may be taken out, done by the human beings. But most of the other information acquisition, uh, take, taking feedback from the environment as the missile is progressing toward the goal or the target, the information analysis and decision selection, all that will be done by the automated missile. But finally, selecting the target and taking the, implement, the, the implementing the action may be left to the human being. Only the operator decides when to fire the uh, missile, for example. Then the question is, how much trust in and dependence on automation is appropriate? Is it appropriate to put a very high trust and dependence on to, and to depend highly on automation? What will influence it? Let us see. And what will happen if it is an over trust or under trust or over dependence or under dependence? Will that influence performance either in the positive or in the negative direction? So, it tr the trust is a cognitive affective state assessed through subjective measures. So, individuals give subjective responses. For example, uh, there may be a questionnaire uh, containing different number of items or questions and they be measured on a seven point scale. So, the operator say, says, I have, a very, I have a very high trust in this automated system or I have full trust or I have trust and then the scale will be for full agree strongly or disagree strongly and uh, you know those are the usual ways in which the subjective measures can be developed. So, trust is a subjective measure, subjective feeling. It is subjective feeling, experience of the individual at, as it says, cognitive and affective, both feeling and the evaluation. So, there is a cognitive evaluation and there is an affective feeling. Uh, how, what is the, what do I feel after using this particular system and when I am using this level of automation in this system? Then dependence. This is an objective behavior which can be assessed in terms of the interaction between the operator and the system. So, how often, for example, the frequency of usage of a particular stage or component in the system, how often the, uh, the individual did use the system to do one of those stages of, say, information acquisition or decision making. So, the proportion of times automation is used. So, it is a, it is an objective measure which can be measured by the behavior of the operator on the system. Automation trust and dependence are positively correlated. So, generally uh, what will happen is that trust and there will be positive correlation. If one increases, the other also increases. If one decreases, the other also decreases. So, uh, most often the analysis can be done on trust and similar analysis will hold for dependence. Now, how much trust in and dependence on automation is appropriate? Several variables affect trust and dependence. 
complexity of the process automation algorithm, for example. If the algorithm is simple, trust and uh, dependence will be high. So, if the algorithm uh, decreases, uh, algorithm complexity goes up, the trust and dependence will decrease. Then individual differences in trust and difference, uh, dependence will be there. So, for the same system, for the same so, uh, uh, algorithm, uh, different individuals will show different levels of trust and dependence. Then automation reliability. How reliable is automation? Will it work under all conditions? Is it a robust automation, for example, irrespective of the changes in the environment? Or So, design is such that under most of the conditions it will work or in certain situations it will not work. So, the reliability may change. How reliable is it? Is it consistent, uh, high, uh, moderate, low? All that will influence the trust and dependence. So, one can um, plot the relationship between subjective trust and automation reliability and also dependence and automation reliability. So, automation reliability is it's a probability. Therefore, it will vary between 0 and 1.0. So, on the horizontal axis, uh, the automation reliability goes from 0 to 1.0 and reliability can be assessed. We discussed about how to assess reliability based on whether the components are connected in series or in parallel and there are other methods. So, probability of failure from where we can determine the reliability of the system as 1 minus probability of failure. Then subjective trust <coughs> is either minimum or maximum. So, on a 7 point scale it can be minimum or maximum. On the other hand, dependence will be either low or high. So, low means the frequency of usage of the automation, relative frequency of usage is either low or high and that can also be observed. So, one is uh, assessment through responses, subjective responses of the operator and the other is physically observed number of times the operator used automation. And then there is a, since there is a correlation, there is a line of perfect calibration. So, now basically trust is calibrated against reliability and similarly dependence is calibrated against rely, automation reliability. So, this line is called line of perfect calibration. So, we can find out at various levels of reliability, we can find out how the trust changes or confidence changes and fit the data to a linear variation or linear curve and then we find that there is a line of perfect calibration. That means, if the system is lying there operation level or reliability is there and subjective trust is there, then there will be uh, acceptable level of trust. So, below this line there is under trust, below the line of perfect calibration there is under trust and above the line of calibration it is over trust. Similarly, for confidence, under confidence or over confidence because the two are correlated. Now, what are the consequences of over trust? Complacency. Over trust can lead to complacency and uh, that can lead to problems. We will see what are the problems with complacency and what happens and then is it once the complacency is there does it continue permanently or something else happens and why does complacency come in? Then automation bias. So, if uh, the automation is there which should be used for complex tasks, then there is a tendency among the users or the operators to use it even for simple tasks. And therefore, with the passage of time, there is a uh, loss of situation awareness. This is called the generation effect. So, if there is an automation bias, if there is the uh, regular use of automation even for simple tasks, then there will be a loss of situation awareness and 
we have seen how the loss of situation awareness can lead to consequences in one of the earlier lectures. Similarly, there will be consequences of over dependence, disliking, disliking for the task for example and out of the loop unfamiliarity. Out of the loop unfamiliarity means that for long time if automation, if it is completely automation that is used for a long time that individual will become unfamiliar and coming back to do that task manually or not using automation will become more difficult. So, let us see uh, the what happens and how does over trust affect the performance or the state of the individual. Now, to begin with when somebody uses automation for the first time the level of trust will be low, it may be in the range of under trust. So, somewhere here let us say and repeated use of the system, automated system, automation for example. So, these uh, lines uh, indicate, arrows indicate repeated use. With repeated use, if the system does well, if automation does well as uh, the goal that has been set is achieved, then over a period of time the, the individual uh, goes into the region of over trust. So, there is an over trust and because the system never failed, the automation did work the way it is expected to work and then again here with repeated application of automation the individual will, will be in a state of complacency. The individual becomes complacent, oh the system is doing well, so I do not really have to do anything and everything will be done by the automated system. And once complacency sets in, at some stage if the system cannot handle the issue uh, that comes up in a particular situation or a trial, then there will be the first failure. <coughs> so, when the first failure occurs, the complacency goes down and if the first failure occurs, there is again a mistrust <coughs> and then again you know because of repeated use there will be again. So, the cycle goes on and at some stage a balance may be achieved or uh, depending upon if the problem persists then uh, some changes in automation or level of automation may be required and which can be introduced. So, this is how new automations may come in and more reliable automations may also be set in. Then there is something called adaptive automation. <coughs> so, uh, as the term says adaptive means adaptation of automation and who decides uh, when to adapt automation, when to develop and implement it. Adaptive automation refers to systems in which both the user and the system can initiate changes in the level of automation. Adaptive automation is similar to dynamic function allocation. So, it is a dynamic process, it is not static, it cannot be decided once for all. Adaptive means that, that the operator adapts, the system adapts to the state of performance of the system or the new situation. So, what does adaptive automation look like? <coughs> Say there is a workload, so when a task is performed, this workload is observed, assessed by a task manager for example and depending upon the workload inferred and inferred capacity to perform of the operator, the task manager uh, may take certain decision and that may be either to apply automation or human being or allocation uh, depending upon what should be the uh, division of the workload between the two and then uh, the task is performed. The performance of task means some external conditions are affected or influenced and so that will come as a feedback. Now, this task manager itself can be either a human being or it can be automated. So, uh, 
that is possible at both levels. So what are uh, automation design considerations? So how do we design automation? And three questions become important. What should be automated? How much automation should be introduced and when? So in terms of tasks, because the purpose of automation is to do a task. So when we say what should be automated, this is task related. And when we say how much, this level of automation related or control, how much control should be there at a particular level as we have talked about levels earlier. Then adaptive automation is when, when should we adapt the automation. So these three things or these three questions become important. So automation design considerations basically it's a level of automation is an approach to human centered automation and what aspects of tasks. So when we say task, what? What aspects of task of task complex should be adapted? There can be adaptive AD that only a part of the task is adapted and part of the task is automated. Adaptive task allocation, entire task is allocated to automation. So depending upon these situations, we can identify the level of automation and various other things and etc. So today we have talked about certain aspects of automation and we will continue with our discussion further. Basically, what we have looked at is two major ideas. One is levels of automation, which can be understood in two different ways. And one of the ways is the use of the information processing model. So relating the level of automation to various stages of information processing. And the other is the adaptive automation. Adaptive automation involves either a decision taken by the system or by the human being or both can collectively take a decision. So there is a task manager <coughs> which can decide or who can decide as to how much work allocation should be there uh, between the uh, automation and human being, who should do how much. So for today, uh, this is what we have done and we will continue with this automation and see now whatever we have done in all the lectures in cognitive ergonomics and human performance, we will see how they can be summarized finally <coughs> into understanding, for example, human computer interaction. And human computer interaction is a very important area because most of the systems now work on computers and therefore understanding how humans inter interact with computers, what is the kind of information flow, for example, between the human beings and the computers, and what is the compatibility between how humans represent information in their mind and how the computer represents information in its cognitive architecture. Thank you very much for today.